now I would like to um, welcome everybody to, to that very um, nice side event that we put together, um, which is um, on the Northern Contaminants Program um, to explain the partnership approach that um, the Northern Contaminants Program is doing on rock monitoring and contaminants monitoring in Germany and Canada. So we um, want to showcase the partnership approach um, in Canada that is done with Indigenous peoples and federal and sub-national government entities. Um, and it's a very unique approach um, that has been very successful in generating capacity, experience, knowledge and data with regards to contaminant, including mercury research in the Canadian Arctic and providing data and information on mercury in the Canadian Arctic internationally in a very efficient way. So what we are hoping is to um, make this successful approach better known as a best practice. Other countries and organizations could maybe use this model to advance partnerships with indigenous peoples and in monitoring efforts and to further the holistic generation of information related to mercury, which can then be used to advance monitoring efforts globally and feed into the Minamata Convention. So we'll start off by, by showing a, um, a little introduction, introduction video and, um, and then we'll have a, a panel of great panelists that will provide some presentations. So I'll start by sharing my screen and, um, and showing the video. So. That's the wrong one. The Arctic remains one of the least polluted regions on Earth. Nevertheless, its unique environment makes it particularly vulnerable to invisible pollutants from distant parts of the globe that make their way to the Arctic through through air, rivers, and oceans, and subsequently build up in the food chain. Indigenous people of Canada's north, including Inuit, First Nations, and Métis, rely on foods harvested from the land and sea as an important part of their diet. These foods provide many health, economic, social, and cultural benefits. However, they can also expose people to contaminants such as persistent organic pollutants, or POPs, and mercury. For more than 25 years, the Northern Contaminants Program has been working in partnership with Indigenous peoples, Northern communities, governments, and scientists to coordinate research activities including the monitoring of contaminant levels in people, and various wildlife species. The goal of the Northern Contaminants Program is to reduce sources of long-range pollutants in the Arctic and provide information that helps Northerners make choices about the foods they eat. The Northern Contaminants Program funds innovative projects that are guided by both scientific and indigenous knowledge, including community-based monitoring of various wildlife species like caribou, ring seal, and fish, and monitoring of contaminant levels in people. While there is still more to learn about this complex issue, we have gained a deep understanding of what contaminants mean for the health of people and wildlife in the Arctic, and about how effective global action can reduce Arctic contaminants. The NCP is also learning about the new chemicals and emerging issues we need to be looking out for in the future. For more information, please visit our website. I hope that everybody was able to um, see that uh, presentation. And um, and now I'm going to hand it over the microphone for our first panelist. Um, and very share my, my screen again. And our first panelist is um, Monica A. Kanayuk, who is the um, President for ICC, the Inutsukumpula Council, just share my screen again.
So please go ahead, Monica. Thank you, Eva. Welcome everybody to this exciting side event where we are going to explain to you the unique partnership approach to mercury monitoring uh, the Northern Contaminants Program of the Canadian government has been taking. As Eva said, my name is Monica El Canayo. I'm the president of Inuit Circumpolar Council, Canada, and I live in the Arctic here in Iqaluit, Nunavut. For those of you who are not familiar with ICC, just a quick introduction. The Inuit Circumpolar Council was founded in the late 70s when the Inuit recognized that they need to speak with one voice internationally. ICC represents about 180,000 Inuit that live across the circumpolar Arctic in Inuit Nunat, the Inuit homeland. This includes Chicago in Russia, Alaska in the US and Canada and Greenland. ICC has offices in all of these countries. ICC Canada's office is located in Ottawa, Canada's capital. It is important to realize that ICC is directed by Inuit in a very democratic process. Every four years, delegates from across Inuit Nunat come together in a general assembly to discuss ICC's work and give direction in a form of a declaration for the next four years. As you have seen in the NCP introduction video, Inuit are highly impacted by contaminants in the travel that travel into the Arctic and make it into our ecosystems and the animals that we rely on for food. Therefore, ICC is directed by its membership to address the issues of contaminants in the Arctic. Next, next slide. <clears throat> this systematic shows how ICC works in the various levels to address contaminants. In Canada, we work within the NCP as one of the Indigenous partners. Sarah Calvo is going to explain more in the next presentation how NCP is structured, as well as the Arctic Monitoring Assessment Program, AMAP. I just wanted to highlight here that we use the information we get from the contaminant studies funded with NCP work within the Arctic Council, in particular AMAP where ICC is one of the permanent participant organizations. We work within AMAP to create assessments on contaminants in the Arctic and try to ensure that Inuit perspectives and concerns are addressed. This information we used in the United States, or, sorry, this information we use in the United Nations, for example, to inform the Minamata Convention on Mercury where ICC is a registered observer. These global agreements can then help to regulate contaminants that lead to the de decreases. The funding for ICC's work on contaminants is mainly coming from the NCP. One example of our work within AMAP is ICC's contribution to the upcoming AMAP Mercury Assessment. The assessment will cover a lot of topics around mercury in the Arctic. ICC co-led a chapter on contributions of indigenous peoples in, to, to the study of mercury in circumpolar Arctic, which is the first of its kind in an AMAP mesh mercury assessment. The chapter is showcasing over 45 community-based mercury projects many of which are conducted in Canada and funded by NCP. The chapter also gives examples of how Indigenous knowledge is utilized in mercury studies and highlights important Indigenous guidance on how 
the research should be conducted in an ethical way. I briefly want to mention another important project, which very much fits with the research topic and is led by ICC Alaska. At the last General Assembly, ICC was directed to work on protocols for equitable and ethical engagement, which could be used internationally to show how Inuit want to be engaged and how research in the Arctic needs to be conducted. ICC Alaska started by contacting Inuit organizations around Inuit Nunat for existing guidance and put together a report that summarizes a collection of over 80 existing Inuit guidance documents. This was the basis for the in-depth discussion in a series of workshops that ICC is holding with Inuit knowledge holders from across Inuit Nunat this fall. From there, draft guidance that will be developed, which will then undergo a review process involving all Inuit regions. We aim to have the guidance finalized next year before our next ICC General Assembly in Greenland. It is important to note that international protocols will not be replacing anything that is existing in the regions or communities, but they will be documenting general guidance that Inuit across the Arctic agree on. There is much more to say that ICC's work and it's impossible to cover everything here, but for more information, please have a look at ICC's website and ICC is also on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and has a podcast series. You can also send us an email. This concludes my introduction to ICC's work on Mercury, and I'm handing the microphone over to Sarah Kahokbor, who will be explaining more about the NCPC structure and how it feeds into the Canadian national work on Mercury, as well as AMAC. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Eva and Monica, for the introduction. My name is Sarah kelhoff bork and I'm pleased to be presenting today on behalf of Canada's Northern Contaminants Program, or NCP, and the Arctic Mon Monitoring and Assessment Program. Next. As you heard in the short video, the NCP works to reduce contaminants such as mercury in food sources harvested from the land, water, and sea, and provide information to help people make informed decisions about the food they eat, primarily Indigenous people for whom these foods are nutritionally, economically, and culturally significant. The focus of this presentation is on how NCP achieves this mandate through partnerships and engagement, through research, monitoring, and assessment, and by supporting action at the local, national, and international level. Next. Mercury in the Arctic is primarily an issue of long-range transport. Mercury biomagnifies in food webs, particularly in marine ecosystems, which provide vital food sources. And this leads in some instances to high levels of mercury in people. Consequently, Mercury in the Arctic is of concern for ecosystem and human health. Next. The Northern and Arctic region of Canada is vast and diverse. It includes 40% of Canada's land mass with a wide diversity of ecosystems, yet less than 1% of our nation's population. The people who live here are predominantly Indigenous, including Inuit, First Nations, and Métis. There are several levels of, and forms of government, national, subnational, and indigenous, with land claim agreements and modern treaties with indigenous peoples that cover almost the entire region. This diversity and complexity is reflected in the NCP. Next. Partnerships are at the core of NCP's governance and operations. Its National Management Committee brings together these various levels of government and several Indigenous organizations from across the region. 
Partnerships with Indigenous people exist throughout the NCP's governance bodies, as well as the projects and activities it supports, backed by funding for this valued participation. Next. Uh, regional committees uh, have been established in five and soon to be six regions. These extend the reach of the program at the local level and play key roles in decision making and outreach, including in relation to the results of mercury research and monitoring and risk communication. Next. At the international level, the NCP works in close partnership with the Arctic Council's Arctic Monitoring and Assessment Program, or AMAP, a relationship fostered over three decades to address Arctic pollution issues such as mercury and climate change. The Arctic Council is the leading intergovernmental forum for the Arctic region, represented by the eight Arctic states, six Indigenous permanent participant organizations, and 39 observers on matters of sustainable development and environmental protection. Next. Turning now to the science and co-development of knowledge. The NCP supports monitoring and research of mercury in the environment and in wildlife that are key to traditional Northern diets, as well as biomonitoring of mercury levels in people. Community-based monitoring ensures that local interests and concerns are addressed. In addition to meeting scientific standards, all NCP projects must meet requirements for meaningful community engagement, capacity building, communication, and appropriate use of Indigenous knowledge. The NCP's core environmental monitoring activities measure mercury in a range of species. Next, from fish and caribou to seals and polar bears in both terrestrial and marine ecosystems right across the north. Behind each icon shown on this map is an abundance of data and information, as well as stories of teamwork and collaborative relationships built up over years or decades among community members and scientists. Next. AMAP's focus is Panarctic and relies on implementation at the national level. With Canada's north making up roughly a quarter of the circumpolar Arctic, the data and information from NCP is crucial when assessing mercury in the Arctic. Through, N through AMAP, NCP's data, results, and information are brought together with that of our Arctic neighbours in order to discern broader temporal and geographic trends. Next. Monitoring mercury in air is critical to understanding long-range transport to the Arctic. AMAP's air monitoring network is multipurpose, measuring mercury as well as other pollutants, and it is further coordinated with other networks to ensure longevity, share costs, and implement common data management. Atmospheric levels of mercury are declining at most sites, though there are some locations, including in Western Canada, where trends are increasing over time. Next. With the data collected by its network, AMAP carries out assessments of the state of the environment and human populations in the Arctic. These assessments document sources, pathways, levels, trends, and effects of contaminants, information that is essential in, in support of international regulatory initiatives. Arctic Council ministers asked AMAP to support the development and implementation of the Minamata Convention, and it has. The resulting reports such as those shown here, are freely available on the AMAP website. Of particular note, the summary for policymakers for the 2021 AMAP Mercury Assessment was released in May, and the full technical report will be coming soon. Next. Reducing contaminant levels in the traditional foods of Arctic Indigenous peoples requires local, national, and international cooperation. NCP and AMAP data information and expertise has contributed to major international policies on contaminants of concern, most not notably for our event today, the Minamata Convention. 
It is also important to note that Indigenous peoples played key roles in the negotiations leading to these conventions and continue important roles in their implementation. Next. Thank you uh, to all NCP partners and to AMAP for the contributions and thank you for your time today. Thank you, Sarah. Our next speaker is Alan Torn, Senior Environmental Health Advisor with the Government of the Northwest Territories Department of Health and Social Services, who will explain how they are involved in the NCP and how NCP information is used in a subnational decision making. Oh, hi, thank you very much for that introduction. So, yes, today uh, for this presentation, I'm going to talk about how the data is used for uh, deriving fish consumption advisories in the Northwest Territory. So, uh, we do um, at the uh, government of the uh, Northwest Territories, the Department of Health and Social Services, we um, depend on uh, the data and information from researchers. And a lot of that research work uh, was um, uh, have been uh, basically been sponsored by the Northern Contam Contaminants Program, and uh, the data comes to um, comes to uh, my department here, and uh, and we take a look at it and we assess that data. So as you know, uh, fish is uh, one of the uh, primary sources for mercury or methylmercury in uh, fish, and that is. Uh, the uh, route uh, for exposure for many uh, folks in the uh, in the Arctic. Uh, and uh, at the Department of Health, we also recognize the benefits of uh, eating fish as it uh, does contain many uh, nutritional um, uh, components of the omega-3 fatty acids, proteins, vitamins, uh, and it also does impart social and cultural benefits as well. So this is very important that we make sure it is always included in our uh, messaging. Um, and um, when we get the data that uh, indicates that uh, there is an issue, then uh, it may um, sort of uh, push us uh, to issue uh, fish consumption advisories. And a pur purpose of these advisory is to um, uh, provide advice to uh, the people in the Northwest Territories uh, on how to minimize the uh, minimize potential health risk to uh, in terms of fish consumption, and so that they can voluntarily restrict their fish consumption. Uh, data and communication requirements. Uh, so, you know, uh, sometimes the data is not as robust as we like it, but we uh, try to make do and uh, there are certain challenges, but it is what it is, uh, but the data is used and we do look at all the data that uh, do come in. And this is sort of an example calculation of how we, uh, we uh, calculate the fish consumption limits. Uh, based on the uh, Health Canada um, guidelines for tolerable daily intakes, and those are some of the uh, values that Health Canada has uh, recommended. Uh, once we, if we do issue fish consumption advisories, we do post them on our website, and uh, as you can see there, and there's also the uh, link to our websites, uh, and you can see it by regions, by the lakes. Uh, and here we post it through another website where we post it on basically a map showing uh, where there are the site specific fish uh, advisories. And uh, you can also uh, tap on the link uh, on this uh, page. Uh, so here's a typical fish consumption advisory that's issued, uh, you know, for uh, the general population versus children versus women of the reproductive. Um, uh, reproductive age, and uh, as you can also see, we also do stress um, that uh, the benefits of uh, eating fish, and we provide sort of the advisories. Um, you know, in terms of in this case, uh, I believe it's on a weekly basis. Uh, so, if you have any questions, you can give me a uh, send me an email, and um, so that's it for my. Uh, Presentation. Thanks.
Thank you, Alan, for explaining how NWT is developing dietary advice and guidance on mercury. The next speaker is Carla Amak, who, who, is ex, who will be explaining her role as the Inuit Research Advisor in Nunatsiavut. Hello, I'm Carla Pamuk. I'm the Inuit Research Advisor for the Nanatsuva government. Um, I'm located in Nain, which is the northernmost community in Nanatsuva, and Nanatsuva is located in the province of Newfoundland and Labrador. Research in Inuit Nunagat has evolved into a process that increasingly incorporates Inuit views, priority issues, research capacity building, and traditional knowledge. These are important elements for supporting Inuit self-determination in, in research. Inuit research advisors in each of the four Inuit regions, Nunatsiawit, Nunavik, Nunavut, and the Inuvialuit Settlement region contribute to this vision and are working with major Arctic research programs like the Northern Contaminants Program to, facil to facilitate the link between researchers and Inuit communities. Roles and responsibilities of the Inuit research advisors differ slightly between regions, but generally include guiding and advising researchers in the following steps of the research process. IRAs can help identify and advocate for regional and community needs and research priorities in the research proposals. To support strong and relevant engagement, Inuit research, <coughs> excuse me, Inert research advisors can help connect re <coughs> researchers with potential community partners and facilitate <coughs> the process of community engagement. Inert research advisors will review proposals as part of the research licensing funding process, so getting their input early can be helpful. Inert research advisors can advise on some project costs in the region. Inuit research advisors are valuable resource contacts throughout the project dur duration. And Inuit research advisors can advise researchers on what to consider when developing a plan for communicating about the research project within the region. They act as a valuable liaison between researchers and, and appropriate organizations or individuals for communication and knowledge translation activities. The Inuit Research Advisor Program is a reflection of an involving research ecosystem and coordinated effort that actively engages Inuit to pursue, to pursue and lead research activities. Since the creation of the Inuit Research Advisor Program in 2004, Inuit, researchers, Inuit research advisors have assisted hundreds of researchers. As Inuit research advisors, we are actively involved in the Northern Contaminants Program. We review proposals for our respective regions, along with regional contaminants committees for the cultural and social review. Some of the criteria that we look for when reviewing proposals are strong engagement in the community or region, and has the project team demonstrated a good working relationship with relevant communities. Is the project a Northern priority and does it address a question that is important to Northerners? Has traditional knowledge been incorporated into the project? And does the project promote capacity building in the North? Does it provide opportunities to train local community members? And how to complete the communication activities prior to the project impl implementation, during the project and after results are received? Inuit research advisors can assist researchers and scientists on all aspects of this. Inert <clears throat> research advisors also assist with field work. During the last couple of years, especially during the COVID pandemic, research in the North was able to continue due to Inuit research advisors and local community members doing the work that would otherwise have been done by the researchers. As the Inuit research advisor for the Nunatsiwut, I am the first point of contact for all researchers interested in doing research in Nunatsiawa, whether they are external researchers or researchers from Nunatsiawa. I act as a liaison with communities and researchers to connect the research team with appropriate people in the community to ensure that the research is 
that the research being conducted is both beneficial and meaningful to both the community and the research project. I am also chair of the Nanatsio Government Research Advisory Committee. This committee is comprised of seven members, each of which represents various departments within the Nunatsiwa government. The committee meets monthly and reviews all research applications for research in Nunatsiwa. You cannot do research in Nunatsiwa without going through our research process. This is just some of the things that I do here in, in Nunatsiwa. And if you would like to have more information, on any of the regions or the research advisors in each of the regions. This is our contact information. I do not have a contact right now for the Inuvialu Settlement region as they currently do not have an Inuit research advisor located there. They are in the process of hiring someone. Thank you. Thank you, Carla. And for explaining your role in the NCP and the activities in Nunatsiavu. The final speaker in this panel is Lisa Lesoto, who is co-leading one of the NCPC's funded projects on beluga monitoring in the Inuit settlement region. Thank you, Monica, and thank you everyone for having me. My name is Lisa Lucetto. I'm a research scientist at Fisheries and Oceans Canada and an associate professor at the University of Manitoba. And today I'm calling you from my home in Winnipeg, Canada, located on Treaty 1 territories. I did first want to begin by acknowledging what I'm speaking to you about today. I'm speaking to you about on behalf of a large research team, which includes our Nubi Alouette partners, uh, my research team, which includes my staff and students and all of the collaborators that we're lucky enough to work with. As you've heard, I'm speaking to you about the Nubi Alouette settlement region. Inuvi Alouette are Inuit from the Western Arctic, and the region shown here in blue includes six communities. All of these communities participate in harvesting beluga whales, and today I'll be focusing my presentation on work occur occurring near the community and with the community of Tuktayaktuk. So in New Yellow, it have been harvesting and hunting beluga whales for the last hundreds of years. And in, in the black and white photo on your left, you see women preparing beluga skin for what might be used later as the bottom of shoes. and. While we don't see some of these traditional uses today, we still see contemporary importance of beluga. Here on the right is a, is a photo of an elder, Clara Day, teaching a youth, Kayla Hansen Craig, how to properly prepare the beluga uh, skin and blubber known as bunktuk for later consumption. So beluga then, as, are, as they are today, are important parts of the cultural, nutritional, and spiritual well-being of a new Alouette. Inuvialuit are also co-managers of resources, and in this case, resources also includes beluga whales. So Inuvialuit have been leaders in thinking about the management of this population for the long-term viability of the health of the whales and the health of themselves by thinking through management and conservation plans, including the development of the first two Arctic marine protected areas uh, depicted in these uh, tiny green uh, points of contact here. Uh, in protecting the beluga whales, what Inuvia Alouette have done have, have included monitoring their harvest of whales over time, documenting the size um, and age of beluga whales since the 1980s. So in the early 2000s, there was a paper that came out depicted here showing concentrations of beluga, of mercury in beluga whales in the Western Arctic in the Inuvia Alouette region being higher than what was observed in other parts of the Canadian Arctic. This came to us and as a call to action to say, what do we know about uh, beluga foraging ecology? What are beluga eating? How are they being exposed to perhaps more levels of, of mercury? How are beluga traveling and moving um, in relation to their ecosystem? So scientists began working more closely with the new Vialuit and existing monitoring programs in place. So here is a photo of, of a team of harvesters, monitors, hunters, and scientific team working together side by side to collect information about beluga whales. And over the last 10 or 15 years, there's been a growth in this community of research. So from the Inuvialuit side, as I mentioned, working closely with elders and youth, hunters, and the monitors who work to collect samples, and from the, as well as co-management boards mentioned previously. And from the scientist side, scientists like myself, 
government researchers, as well as I engage, we engage with uh, university scientists and veterinarians to come together to better understand what's happening with the beluga whales. In these settings, when we're working together, we're learning from each other. We're sharing our knowledge in that place and in that moment. Uh, we're listening to each other, and it's it's been important that we all respect each other's knowledge systems and, and what we know and, and how we've come to know that. And these um, these relationships have grown and fostered and, and have become extremely meaningful and supporting how we develop the project and how we move forward. However, outside of these fields, that settings are extremely important as well as we think about creating spaces where we share information and enhance the programs. So here I've just got a few photos of different ways in which we work together outside of just the regular field setting. So including meetings with communities and boards. So these boards are made up of elected community representatives to speak on behalf of, of their hunters and speak about the type of priorities they have in looking at beluga health, contaminants, mercury. Uh, we also engage with uh, board members, uh, community monitors and conferences and networks. So at these conferences, we're able to share, for example, what we share today, new knowledge that we're gaining, but also we're able to learn from, from other studies in other places. We work with youth and elders um, to enhance how we share information. So when we look at the program now, here I'm showing you a list of all the different things we look at. We believe we have perhaps the most intensive holistic program to understand beluga health that looks at everything, including contaminants, as well as other health factors such as disease, uh, physiology, trying to understand what other stress whales might be undergoing um, by looking at uh, novel genomic techniques, understanding the foraging ecology, and of course, importantly, including uh, the indigenous knowledge of the area. So in closing, I did want to highlight the, the value of this partnership that has strengthened the science to be you know, internationally renowned. Here I'm showing you photos from the a meeting we held in 2016 that engaged scientists working in the area, as well as community members from all six communities. And we came here, we shared our knowledge, we identified gaps and priorities and set a path moving forward. And I, and I uh, promote this type of research and partnership uh, to strengthen where we are in terms of our, our understanding of, of health and systems. So with that, thank you. Thank you, Lisa. This great example of Mercury Project in the ISR and how you work with Inuit knowledge holders. That was very interesting. I would like to open the floor now for questions from the audience. And please type your question in the chat or raise your hand so we can give you the floor. So I uh, need to be able to see the participants. Okay, while we're waiting for uh, someone to either raise their hand or put a question to the chat box, I have a question to the NCPC uh, panelists that are he here with us. Can you explain how Indigenous knowledge is used in the work with uh, NCP and if there are a lot of difficulties in the last little while. I know you mentioned a bit with COVID uh, being uh, um, in the way, but luck, like the um, community um, support was there in regards to conducting research, especially in the Arctic. But how did the pandemic influence the work that you had in hand? I'm, I'm happy to jump in, Monica. Um, so with regards to the inclusion of in traditional knowledge with the programs, it's been really vital, especially during the times of COVID when we're no longer, scientists haven't been able to be up there in partnership with the communities. And so hearing from the communities and their observations has been critical. 
programs have continued and samples are being collected and being sent down, but we, we really depend on the community observations to help interpret what's happening. And so, for example, this year, the communities have been fantastic in sharing observations of changes in, in the color of the blubber, the thickness, the consistency, and, and how they prepare it. Um, all of this information really helps put a big picture understanding on thinking about beluga health. So indigenous knowledge um, has been important throughout, but I think during COVID has been heightened. Thank you. I think we have some questions in the chat box. Um, I, um, if I'm, maybe Eva, you can, um, ask some of those questions that are in the chat box because my chat box here is very, very small. <laughs> sure. So maybe you can see them a <laughs> bit more clearly than me. Thank you. Sure, sure, Monica, I can do that. So um, Katka, um, I don't know if, if you want to ask a question yourself or um, should I read it out for you? Um, if you want to read it out yourself, then I think the secretary could give you the floor. Otherwise I can read it out. So um, maybe I read it out then. So Katka says, uh, thank you for showing us how you work together and in full transparency and spirit of cooperation. Would you please elaborate a bit more on the overall monitoring guidance and how it can say, uh, serve the Minimada Convention? That might, uh, might be something that, um, Sarah, do you wanna speak to that maybe? Yes, and th thanks for that uh, for the question. I, I think there's a number of uh, of lessons that uh, that can help inform um, and guide uh, the Minimata Convention. Uh, certainly, uh, the need across programs to to have comparable methods um, um, and quality control and you know these the the scientific details of how that's done and across programs that that is really important so in terms of the monitoring uh, framework that's developed in the guidelines on from a technical sense um, what we're also trying to show is that uh, that there can be wide participation in contributing to the to uh, minimatic convention to the science and so uh, ways of working we got a lot uh, to contribute in terms of understanding and presenting ways of working with communities, uh, um, uh, including uh, communities and individuals who don't have, a, a, may not have the technical science background from a university, but who are, have incredible uh, skills and knowledge to, to contribute to this. So there's, there are a number of elements there and I hope that, uh, uh, gets at your answer and, and perhaps uh, um, Lisa might also have something to add on that. Thank you. Lisa, did you want to add to that? No, that, that was great, Sarah. Thank you. All right. And I think the next question, if my, if I can read my chat box, sorry, it's very small. Um, thank you for the informative presentation. Is there a cooperation with similar indigenous organizations outside of the Arctic region? So um, that's another. Other question. I don't know if uh, the person had wanted to say that or if they were okay with me reading it out. Um, I can't re really see clearly the <laughs> who it came from. Sorry about that. Go ahead. Well, perhaps I can begin by jumping in with an, an answer to that. Uh, just two weeks ago, uh, the Northern Contaminants Program held what's called its results workshop and uh, for the normally an in-person event, but it was held for obvious reasons as an online forum. Uh, and that also enabled broader, wider participation. And we had a group 
uh, from from Peru, and I'm hoping someone is on the call on this, uh, uh, perhaps in the audience here today, who who did who presented at our workshop about uh, the concerns uh, in in the Amazon regions of Peru, uh, their concerns with mercury and the challenges that are being faced, and uh, they wanted to learn as well from the Canadian experience. Uh, about um, how we've dealt with uh, with some similar issues. So we're just beginning, I would say, to uh, sort of share the, the inf share the the process of how our program runs, and we're certainly open to uh, to to sharing sort of the, the details, and also, uh, of course, through through uh, the Arctic Council. It has been shared with uh, other Arctic countries. Thank you. The next question is, um, let's see if I could read the name. Ilham from Egypt, he would like for us to read it out. Thank you for the presentations. Are there any projects focusing specifically on educating women regarding the impact of mercury on the health of pregnant women and their babies. And are you aware of such in initiatives in other countries of the Arctic region? I'm not sure who, who would answer that. Maybe um, you, not sure. Sarah again? Sure, I can take this or perhaps if Alan. You want to say something. Okay, Alan, go ahead. Um, uh, I can only speak for the Northwest Territories, um, but I know that um, uh, a couple of months ago, uh, there was a uh, workshop that was set up and it was a virtual um, type uh, setup where okay. um, there was uh, sort of a, the educational um, uh, comp uh, program uh, to provide information to women. And I think it also included their impact on, for example, the babies uh, with respect to uh, mercury and, uh, and food. Um, and so I remember uh, just preparing a really, really small uh, uh, presentation on on that particular uh, topic to provide um, um, uh, folks uh, where with uh, information on where they can get access where, where they can access the fish consumption advisories and then the um, so we, there were people from health uh, from the uh, nutritionists um, you know folks with the nutritionist background as well as uh, nursing and uh, so um, I think that forum was um, uh, that's how it was done there. I would also add, uh, if I may, go ahead, Marta, uh, that the NCT yeah, has a very uh, long standing program in the Nunavik region of, of Canada, working with Inuit there, a project uh, previously now led by uh, Dr. Melanie Lemire, and working specifically uh, with women of childbearing age. Uh, pregnant women um, and and women with babies uh, to to uh, educate to also understand contaminant levels and the connection uh, between mercury levels and the food that's uh, consumed, uh, uh, particularly during pregnancy. So that is a long term program, and it 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 uh, it is continuing. Um, there have been spin-offs from that program as well with providing uh, fish to pregnant women, um, um, species that are known to be lower in contaminants levels, such as Arctic char. Uh, so it is definitely something that we focus on as a program. Um, and I'm not the best one to speak about uh, this in areas outside of the Arctic region. Um, uh, but uh, Dr. Melanie Lemire uh, with the uh, University Laval would be an excellent person to speak on that. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. And um, 
for those uh, answers. The next question is, is from uh, John Mumbo to everyone. What type of contaminants are detected in food? Uh, mercury was one that uh, was mentioned in the environment, etc. And what measures are being taken to enforce uh, enforce that? Thank you. Um, who would like to answer that? Uh, yeah, so I can uh, provide a partial answer to that in terms of uh, how it applies to the Northwest Territories again. And uh, so there's a, a sort of a the research work that's being carried out uh, actually covers a large number of uh, contaminants. Um, you know, as you've probably seen one of the earlier PowerPoint presentations, they cover the uh, persistent organic pollutants which is a whole range of uh, organic pollutants in themselves, as well as uh, metals. Uh, when we look at uh, mercury, we look at cadmium, uh, lead, um, and uh, so forth. So um, those data, uh, when they, when, as again, they, um, you know, uh, the researchers share with our uh, department, and this is uh, the great thing about the collaborative effort that happens here. Uh, is then sort of that discussion uh, is a significant issue, and if it is a significant issue, then um, then we basically uh, we run it through here. We run it through the um, chief public health officer who has legislative, um, um, uh, you know, the uh, the mandate to provide such advisories, and uh, and. Uh, so we, um, if an advisory is necessary, then we prepare one, uh, she reviews it, and, uh, and then uh, authorize it for posting on our web. So we've done it for, uh, for example, for cadmium and uh, moose uh, liver uh, in the uh, Mackenzie Valley uh, within the uh, Northwest Territories, one particular, very, very particular, that specific area. Um, and uh, I know that in the past we've looked at a lot of other organic uh, pollutants, for example, um, in Burbit or the Losh. And um, and uh, when we run the uh, risk calculations, it uh, indicated that the risk of eating the um, um, the uh, liver uh, from Burbit is uh, fairly low. So. Uh, yeah, the data is uh, very, very carefully vetted through, and uh, there's uh, quite a bit of discussion, and we try to bring it to the uh, communities uh, or the community that uh, may be impacted. Uh, for example, um, the um, uh, the harvesting of the country food could, uh, where the research is done, is very, very specific to uh, a certain community or a number of communities. So uh, advisories are basically are, uh, you know, that's part of the consideration of uh, basically that uh, discussion with the affected uh, communities as well. Thank you, Alan. Um, there is also a question from, from John again on the monitoring required um, funding. Who is funding these activities and is it through the governments or the NGOs, uh, he'd like an explanation. And I think we've got like about five, five more minutes, minutes here or so. So um, maybe NCP can answer that one. Thank you. Yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah, so the Northern Contaminants Program has a an annual budget of about $4.1 million Canadian annually uh, and a little more than half well, more than half of that goes to the research and monitoring itself, and it goes uh, out uh, directly to uh, to universities. It supports other federal, uh, sorry, uh, government um, researchers, and a lot of it goes to communities uh, in partnership. So it 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 gets dispersed to to those who are implementing, and the other. Uh, um, a large component of the funding goes to supporting uh, organizations uh, who who don't have the capacity otherwise to participate in the program. Uh, so indigenous organizations. Uh, in addition, um, we we also have uh, we're looking, as we mentioned, not only at mercury but also 
uh, persistent organic pollutants, uh, chemicals of emerging Arctic concern, and now microplastics. So we have some additional funding for that as well. So uh, it is uh, widely distributed within within Canada. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. And I think we might have one more question, and that was uh, one that is from Elham, and he'd like to know what is the most challenge that you face in your work? I guess it's similar to what are the biggest difficulties that you face at your employment and how do you think improvements can be made? Thank you. So maybe Carla or Lisa might uh, be best placed to to uh, respond to that. Yeah, sure. I can take a stab at this one. Um, I think some of the biggest challenges that we face in the Arctic is with regards to capacity in the region. We always would like to see more capacity within the region to be able to do the work that is so important to us up here in the Arctic with regards to contaminants. And our food sources, um, I think that is one of the biggest challenges that that we face, especially what we face here in Nunatsiavut. And we have a really great team here in Nunatsiavut doing the work as well. Um, Lisa, did you want to add anything? Sure. No, just to say, I think the amount of work to do what it is we we do requires a lot of a lot of people and a lot of support. Um, so building capacity is an, is an important task and challenge. Um, I think time is a challenge. I, I spent a lot of time talking about the importance of developing relationships and partnerships to do really good research. So, so that takes time, but then there's often this urgency to have information and data made available. So there's, I think the challenge of, of, of um, meeting, meeting expectations in a, an ethical and, and patient way. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you. Eva, um, how are we doing for time? I think there's one more question that we haven't uh, asked or, or yeah. how are we doing? Yeah, that's a good question, Monica. So maybe the Secretariat would uh, tell us if we are cut off or if we could attempt to answer uh, one more question. Of course, you can attend. And I can see that there are like two questions, in fact, uh, one from Joseph and the other one from Beatrice. So you can go ahead. Yes, of course. Okay, that's all right. Maybe um, maybe you can ask those questions. I I'm right at the very bottom, so I'm not sure which one. Okay, that I'm, Monica, I can I can read passed. them. So, so you... there's yeah, there's the Thank one you. of the questions says Canada has a good mercury regulation. Please, your work is inspired from this regulation. Okay. So perhaps I can just say on that uh, that the NCP itself is not a regulator. So we do work with those uh, who are responsible for regulation within within the country. So we have a close one again one of our partnerships. Uh, so we do work hand in hand with them, uh, and uh, so I think it, it's. Again, more of a um, we pro we provide data at that national level to to inform the decisions, um, and we rely on our on our regulators to to respond and and to uh, participate internationally. So uh, it's it's again a uh, a working relationship. Um, if I could say one thing about uh, the previous question and challenges. I would like to highlight that one of the challenges for in the in uh, the north is communicating um, risk about uh, the risk of mercury exposure when we're dealing with uh, a food source which also provides uh, benefits. So it's always a balance of providing information to make informed decisions, but not unnecessarily scaring people off of food. Source that is so critical to uh, to their well being. Thank you. 
Thanks, Saran. Um, by May, I will read the, the last uh, question from Beatrice saying, when considering sources of mercury, especially for pregnant women and children, is dental amalgam considered as a source? If so, what is the thinking about banning this? Um, actually, with respect to the mercury, um, it's the um, when we run the calculations for mercury, where, for example, in food, we are really, really looking at methyl mercury versus uh, total uh, versus uh, mercury. Uh, and uh, when we're kind of so when you're kind of uh, looking at dental amalgam. Um, the dental amalgam can certainly release uh, mercury vapor, uh, but a lot. Uh, but my understanding is is that the uh, mercury vapor uh, that's that may be absorbed uh, there basically uh, can also be released from the body uh, in its in its uh, in its form. So, um, in terms of basically the exposure of mercury, uh, my understanding has always been is the it's the methyl mercury of concern. Uh, sometimes when we get the data, it's uh, it's uh, as a total mercury, for example, in in food. Uh, but um, you know the research has shown that a lot of the um, this uh, methyl mercury and, for example, the fish muscles or uh, meat muscle is um, is uh, basically is uh, the um, uh, sorry sorry the fish muscle is, uh, tends to be the uh, methyl mercury form. Uh, so it's um, um, the, the, so the majority of the methyl mercury uh, that's basically in the uh, for example total mercury and fish tissue, um, you know it's uh, it's mostly uh, methyl mercury. Yeah. So uh, in terms of uh, getting back to your question on the dental mal amalgam, um, yeah, it's um, yeah I'm I'm not aware of it being the uh, as uh, in terms of as uh, as a uh, Sort of a human exposure issue, and uh, anyway, uh, on a somebody else here, that's a different perspective. Okay, thank you very much. If there are no uh, more replies, I can see that there are no more questions on the chat, but a request uh, to share the presentations, and then I mean after the meeting we can uh, coordinate with you that. Uh, if you wish so, I'm referring to panelists, we can make all the presentations available on the Minamata Convention uh, website, if that's agreeable with you. Yes. Okay, so with that, uh, thank you very much for all your insights and shared experiences on this unique approach to contaminant mercury monitoring in the Canadian Arctic and the holistic effort to support indigenous peoples by generating capacity, knowledge, and data. I think all of us learned a lot from you today. Uh, we will take just one minute before closing the meeting to uh, save the chat. And I wish you all the best and take care. Thanks. And thank you very much to the um, Secretariat for all your help and support. That was really great. And um, to all the panelists for your awesome presentations and the time that you took. So um, thank you very much for that. I, I really um, enjoyed it very much. And um, and I hope that uh, the audience enjoyed it as well. Thank you. For sure. Thanks. Bye bye.